Happy New Year. Good morning, everybody. For, for those of you who don't know, first off, we are doing something new. So this is being streamed live, aside from being recorded. So there's a little camera over there. So hi, little camera over there. And we tweeted about it, so we'll see what happens. If anybody's out there in the internet land. And for the sake of those people, I'm Kevin Raymack, General Director of Minnesota Opera. Good morning, everybody, again. Um, this is always great for me because all I have to do is, uh, is say, welcome, everybody. Let's have a good time. And Dale Johnson has to do all the heavy lifting. So Dale Johnson, <laughs> Artistic Director of Minnesota Opera. Um, thanks. <laughs> Thank you all. Um, you know, I was going to get the twerking for this one. I, it didn't work. I just didn't. I just didn't have time. And <laughs> today, I don't have the energy for it. But anyway, so um, uh, welcome to Macbeth. Now, Macbeth is uh, a, an extraordinary opera. It's an experimental opera on Verdi's part. Uh, it was written very shortly after Nabucco, which we did last year. Uh, Nabucco is a very different kettle of fish from this piece. But Nabucco was monumental, loud, louder and loudest, uh, faster, higher. Right, Brenda? Where are you, Brenda? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, this piece is really kind of the opposite. And Verdi, in choosing Macbeth, he was fascinated with Shakespeare, but in choosing Macbeth, he started experimenting with writing music that was not built on a traditional structure. Uh, he started writing music that in fact matched the dramatic intent of all of the characters and the telling of the story. Now, of course, you know, when we look backwards from now, it still feels like a, a heavily structured piece. But in fact, it was quite experimental for its time, uh, both in uh, the way he wrote for the characters. Uh, the, the Macbeth sing very softly a lot of the time in a very sort of conspiratorial manner. <laughs> that, that's true. Well, with these two, we'll, you know, but, um, but in fact, it, uh, it was such a successful uh, 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 transformation from the, from the play. He reduced it, he reduced the play to really focus on the three main characters, which were Macbeth, Lady Macbeth, and the witches. Uh, and then, of course, surrounded all of these characters with wonderful other characters, like Banquo and Macduff and Malcolm. Um, and so to do this piece, you have to really be able to cast it well. And we were actually going to be doing another opera this time. Uh, but when we found out both that Brenda and Greer were available, and that Alfred was available, and then Harold was available, we decided we have to do this show. Uh, because first of all, uh, Brenda and Greer ha have done Macbeth before, uh, and they like doing it together, and they like working together. So we thought, let's put this all together and see what we've got. Um, so I, first of all, want to reintroduce, he, he hasn't been here for a while. His last appearance wa with us was in The Flying Dutchman. Here's Greer Grimsley. <laughs> Now, Brenda, of course, was here last year for Nabucco, uh, but one of her favorite roles is Lady Macbeth, and so we, we had to have Brenda Harris back to do it. <laughs> now, the character Banquo is a very different sort of character than the, than the Macbeths. And he's sort of the conscience of the opera, and his music reflects it. So you had to find somebody who sang beautiful long lines with a kind of sonorous sound that only Alfred Walker has. <laughs> and then last year, we did, of course, uh, La Boheme in the Parks. Uh, through the wind and the rain. <laughs> and uh, we were very lucky to uh, have uh, Harold Mears sing Rodolfo for us. And uh, while, during that time, um, I asked uh, Harold to come and sing a couple of other arias for me, and one of them was Macduff. And so I said, you're hired. So here's Harold Mears. <laughs> I didn't say it to him, I said it to his agent. 
Um, and then we have our wonderful uh, our resident artists doing lots of other arias, and I have my cheat sheet here so I don't make a mistake. We have uh, Shannon Prickett doing the Lady in Waiting. Where are you, Shannon? Back there. <laughs> Christian Zaremba, where are you, Christian? Um, is doing the assassin, the doctor, and the servant. Matt Opitz is doing the first apparition and the herald. Uh, Riley Eddins, who's in our Project Opera chorus, is doing the second appar apparition and fléance. Uh, and then Christy Hageman is doing the bloody third apparition. <laughs> um, and of course, uh, it's great to have Andrew back. Andrew, where are you? Andrew Landis. Yay! Yay, hey, welcome back. Um, and of course, uh, Michael Christie will be in the pit, uh, and uh, we know how good that's going to be, and it's a real pleasure to have Rob Ainsley preparing this very difficult chorus and very difficult uh, singing roles for Macbeth as well. Uh, but, but let's really get to uh, the exciting part of this, which is telling the story of this production of Macbeth. After uh, Nabucco was such a success in working with um, uh, Joel uh, over the time, we decided to ask him to create this new production. So uh, it's a great pleasure to have Joel Ivany back, uh, and I'm going to turn it over to him. He's going to introduce um, his cohorts in this production, Joel Ivany. Hey. Huh? Oh, I'm sorry. See, I always do it. John. <laughs> Hi everybody, I'm Joel Ivney, I'm from uh, Toronto, that's where I live in Canada. And um, this over here who will be talking along with me is Camilla Koo, who is the scenic coordinator and the costume designer for this production. We've worked uh, together for a few years now. We, we won a competition in Europe and then we both did uh, Tales of Hoffman in a new production in Edmonton where you've sung this role before. And then you both sung this in Ottawa, I believe. Yeah. So there's lots of, on Facebook, everyone's been saying, say hello to, I worked with this and that and that. So you're all, it's kind of crazy how it's all connected. Um, but this story is very, very exciting on several different reasons. Um, it's called The Tragedy of Macbeth. You've probably heard of this when you've been going through high school or something. For me, it was one of my favorite plays because it just had so many just raw emotions that come out from just reading it, let alone seeing it, or experiencing it, or putting it on the big stage. Um, and just to give, I don't know, for me, I wanted to start with the history of how it all began. And so if you bear with me for a couple minutes, I'll give you a little bit of background on, on this idea of Macbeth. He was a real person. The real Macbeth reigned in Scotland from 1040 to 1057. No, you're shaking your head no. Is that right? Oh, you can't believe it. Okay, you're like, no, he did not. I'm a Scottish major. Yeah, so he, long time ago, exactly. Um, and then it got written about in different books. Different kings found it very interesting. And then Shakespeare took that story and wrote his own interpretation between 1603 to 1607. They're not sure when exactly it kind of was done. But the first folio appeared in 1623, I believe of the play. From there, that play got taken by an Italian, Carlos Rusconi, who wrote an Italian translation of the play. Then that Italian translation was taken by Francesco Maria Piave, and he used that for his edition of the libretto of the opera. Verdi kept saying, there's too many words, there's too many words, there's too many words. Cut, 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 cut. And so he got kind of fed up a little bit with Piave at different times. And so he engaged another Italian, Andrea Maffei, who was an Italian poet and translator who made revisions to the libretto that Piave made. He's like, I'm having trouble with this scene. Can you fix this? So again, words getting changed around, changed around yet again. So from there, that's where he kind of started conceiving the opera. Um, he Verdi couldn't speak English. He, um, and he had never seen Macbeth before he wrote the opera. He saw it about a year after he wrote it. So it was, but he says he wrote that he always sort of um, read Shakespeare growing up, but again, he's reading a translation 
and that translator would put in or choose how he would translate Shakespeare. And so in a lot of ways, there's certain scenes left out in the opera, and that's partly because the Italian translator didn't put that in the translation. So in some things, he just didn't even know were there. And he thought, well, we can't have Lady Macduff, who's murdered, and all the kids, so let's just skip over that. And so that's kind of one reason why it's not in the opera as well. He wrote, sorry, with all these wonderful letters, here is the draft of Macbeth. This tragedy is one of the greatest creations of man. If we can't do something great with it, let us at least try to do something out of the ordinary. And he was really, as, as Dale mentioned, trying to look to do something different with this piece. Um, um, Weber's Der Freischutz had just come out, uh, Robert Le Diable around the same time, these kind of operas that dealt with the fantastic elements. Don Giovanni was around for a while and with going to hell being dragged at the very end. So he kind of wanted to dive into something a little different. And he started off right, right off the bat with these um, sort of already the play Three Witches, whereas in this opera, there are three groups of witches. So all of a sudden, times three, infinity, however many you can hire. <laughs> um, the opera was revised. It was presented in 1847, and uh, it went pretty well. It was a kind of a different experience from now. They, they would, uh, the very first number, the witches chorus that they sang, uh, they presented it for the very first time. Imagine being in the theater. Mad applause, they encored the whole thing. They did it again. And then they brought out the maestro halfway through, so he'd come out, he'd bow. He'd bow, he'd say, yeah, 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 clap, 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 clap. He'd walk off, and then the opera would keep going. But then that would happen continuously throughout the entire opera. They would just curtain call the maestro to come out to just stop. So there was no like wait for the intermission. It was like after every song, he would come out and take a bow in front of everyone and then just kind of keep going. So it was kind of a different vibe from what it was now. He was like the rock star of Italian, of opera, of the opera world. Um, so, but it was then revised. He came back to it later in life and in 1865 it was presented in Paris in French and they added a giant ballet, because that's what you do in Paris, you add ballets. So he wrote this big ballet, which we are not unfortunately presenting in this production. We're just cut, cutting right to the, the chase, so to speak. But um, they added the big sort of, a big duet at the end of act three between you two. Originally it was a Macbeth aria, and then they added this kind of vengeance duet. And then he added the final chorus at the end of the whole opera, it's a lot more gets going right at the end, as, as you'll hear. Um, and it kind of had mixed reception, played for 13 shows, and then kind of disappeared um, until 1900. So it was kind of very interesting to see the history and success and whether the revisions were successful. So that's, that's how I started with. That's how we ended up with what we have. He called it a tragedy. And a tragedy led me, I hooked on that word, tragedy. And that led me to going even further back, Socrates, who wrote his Poetics, if you've heard of Socrates' Poetics, 335 BC, long, long time ago. We're getting into it. And he wrote that tragedy is an imitation of events that inspire fear or pity, fear and or pity. Fear and pity is better to be aroused by the inner structure of a piece rather than by spectacular means. In a tragedy, plot is primary, and a well-written plot should have a change of fortune from good to bad. It should come about as a result of some great error or frailty in one's character. Ding, 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 ding. <laughs> he wrote, the chorus too should be regarded as one of the actors. It should be an integral part of the whole and share in the act action. Ding, 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 again. And for me, this is Macbeth. There is this hugely fantastical element with the apparitions, with these witches, which are otherworldly beings. But at the heart of it, what, I'm, what we're hopefully going to work on is telling the plot, which is in Verdi's Macbeth, as best we can and let, let the other elements take care of itself. We have, as you can see, a lighting designer who's going to be fantastic and brand new projections in video, which will go along with this. And um, that's where they really play. This is a rough, but that's kind of Burnham Woods when we get into Act 4. That's an actual one that'll be projected. We have like 
behind, as we, you'll get into it, but we have behind, we have from the front, from on top, is what we're hopefully going to be doing with video and moving, and the apparitions are a huge scene for that as well. Um, fear and pity, and or pity. There's great evidence of fear, obviously, in Acts 1, 2, and 3. And then you obviously get into pity, which is all over Act 4, which is what's beautiful about this opera. Act 4 is such a change from the rest of the opera with the opening of the refugees. He kind of wrote this. We all saw maybe Va Pensiero, or were part of it. And he's kind of said, that one did really well. Let's try to write something similar to that. And that's how Act 4 starts. Um, and then we get into Macbeth's aria, which is Pietà, Rispetto, Amore. Right there, he's saying it. And then Lady Macbeth's sleepwalking scene, which that was another highlight. He knew he was going to write this incredible aria, and then it, he did, and then everyone loved it, and then that stuck, like that has been the staple of this. That aria is kind of a, one of the big hooks. There's a big duet in Act One. That's another huge moment that he kind of knew and happened. So that's kind of exciting. Unpack, we will unpack more in rehearsal, but the plot is a leaping point for the discovery, which hopefully we'll see. You'll get visuals now, but then you'll experience it in three and a half weeks or something like that, which will be exciting. Um, big themes that you'll see are ambition. The ambition of Macbeth, as soon as he hears these witches kind of just toss out, hey, wouldn't you like to be the boss kind of thing. If, if someone just said that to you walking down the street, do you want to run Minnesota Opera? All of a sudden, Kevin is a little bit worried, <laughs> maybe. No, actually. No? <laughs> right. You've got me on the right day. Right. <laughs> yeah. um, then there's the power, the power of once, once that is insight, and then wanting more and not being fed or satisfied. And then you have this beautiful theme, which is kind of in and out of this innocence. You have Fleance, who's kind of this uh, character who you, he, you see him a little bit. He doesn't say too much. But then he, he weaves his way in and, and babies. And the idea of a, a line and the Macbeth line will kind of end. There's no kind of hope. And what does that mean as well? So there's this carrying on in the legacy as well. Um, Verdi wrote. He said, above all, bear in mind that there are three roles, which Dale said, in this opera, and three is all there can be. Lady Macbeth, Macbeth, and the chorus of witches. The witches dominate the drama. Everything derives from them. Chorus and gossipy in the first act. Sublime and prophetic in the third. They are truly a character, and a character of the utmost importance. And so he's written such this juicy part for this, the female chorus, which will, I, I can't wait. I, I think they're very excited to work on this, and it's going to be such a, such a, you'll see once we get into what they're going to look like and what they're going to do. Um, and then, as he mentioned, he wanted this piece to be very dramatic and musical. Um, where is the one? He said, I'll never stop urging you to study the dramatic situation and the words well. The music will come by itself. In a word, I'd rather you serve the poet better than you serve the composer. And that's what Verdi wrote to Varese, who played the very first Macbeth. He really wanted to, the singer to dive into the, the words and the, the dramatic situation of this. And that's kind of where he experimented with the writing musically of it, with kind of the, the covered sound at times. And just he really wanted this piece to thrive. Um, and he, the very first Varese, he wrote it again that he was very ugly and very short. So we've kind of gone away from that with, with the real one. But I think that's OK as well. So only a character. <laughs> so where do we begin with this? Um, we'll show you uh, again, yeah. We started with um, pulling different set elements from different productions that Minnesota Opera had. Um, and with that, we had that in mind before we conceived this, going into how it would look. Uh, we had the freedom of building brand new costumes for the whole production with our cast in mind, and then brand new projections and video. So all that's going to make this piece feel as it is, like a new production. Um, so let's, let's start with, oh yeah, reference material of what we started with. Um, it starts with a battle. They come back, Banquo Macbeth 
they've been fighting in war. And that's where Macbeth feels very comfortable. He feels being sort of the, not the general, but kind of the top fighter man. He, that's where he feels comfortable and where he's in his element. And it's not until this idea of, what if you were to do this, that um, it leads him astray. So we looked at different images of war, of, of in the past, different, and these were some of the things. And it led to kind of these gas mask images um, that were more kind of World War I. There's no necessarily no specific time period that we're setting this opera in. It's kind of a, a choreographed mish of lots of different things that fit as one, which is kind of exciting as well. So you'll see that here. We have a couple of these that s you never have to sing with it on, but <laughs> you'll have some reference on the side. The tenors who aren't singing in the first little bit, they'll, they'll be able to sport these very well. Um, and that's kind of one little bit of element. Next one, Macbeth. Maybe Cammy can also yeah. jump in and speak on some of this so, as well. So we're referencing a few different, we're referencing yeah. a few different eras, a few centuries. Um, we have World War One. we've got very modern. The set, for me, helped sort of dictated that because we were we had to use these, um, these elements from the set and it had a very urban feel. It's a very concrete slab feel. So it had a much more modern feel to it and trying to do it completely period didn't feel right on the set. Um, so, because um, it, it has to all look like it's 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 a cohesive thing, and so it sort of we were just going down this path. What, what so there's a, there's some leather, there's some coats, um, and then and then the, you'll see that the, later on the witches have a very Victorian um, look to them, and it just it just sort of we actually started more with the witches and and went out that way, um, and just how how things fell in. So hopefully it doesn't look collagey that everything looks cohesive and we started creating our own period, our own style as opposed to we're setting it, we're setting Macbeth in 1913 England, you know what I mean? We're trying to create something a bit different. Um, and I really do want it to stay away from, because we're also modernizing, we want to stay away from suits and ties. So, um, yeah. <laughs> Next, yeah. The These witches. are some of our images for the witches. So this is one of our courses, hair, because it's, it's great hair. <laughs> um, and, and we're going to have a, a lot of people have wigs. This is sort of the direct reference for our witch coats. And you'll see here, and it moves really beautifully. And, um, it has a really nice line. And it just gives them a bit more volume, a little bit more movement when they move. Um, our references, we had, we were in Victoria, and there were these, we're in the middle of a city, and there's these crows everywhere in the middle of the city, and Tokyo is the same thing. It's, it's an odd thing to see in an urban place, um, these, these amazing birds, and that was something that spoke to us about being washed all the time as well, uh, which was interesting for this idea where the witches came from. Yeah, you go for a jog, and like, you just stand, and then they kind of follow and just kind of watch you as you're kind of going, but then they kind of fly ahead, and you always kind of feel like there's this thing like, what's going on behind those beady eyes of theirs? So that's kind of how it kind of got started. Something interesting, like, because we didn't, we were, when we were talking about the witches, we didn't know, we didn't want to feel it, making them sort of these complete creatures felt wrong, and making them hags felt wrong. So we needed to, we wanted to try to find what else they could be, and this was sort of really kind of perfect. And, um, and there's a big, obviously, a comedia feel to them too, a uh, tiny bit, and just sort of, yeah. Because in that kind of reference, the comedian mask also referenced kind of the gas mask, that you can kind of see this rough similarities of the two of them. So it kind of, that's where it morphed, and that's how it kind of de developed into what they are now. So they will be wearing kind of, this is it, kind of these masks that will have, um, they've all tested it and they feel comfortable wearing it, so that's kind of good. Um, but they will kind of, and you even see in the costume fitting photos, they just, as soon as you wear a mask, you can just change your whole body type, and it changes how you, how you act and how you behave. So that's what all the female chorus are. I mean, purely practical, it also makes sense, just because we, could, we can't do like big makeup changes between all of the chorus looks, too. So it's a way to completely make them look different with their masks and these coats, and um, because they have to play the other citizens as well. And so. Yeah. But it, 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 it's great, great dance. Next, that's next. Oh yeah, so this is <laughs> very colorful. Um, the, there's a huge moment, the whole kind of plot changes with that prophecy that Macbeth can be the king of Scotland. And how's that gonna happen? Well, you gotta take out the king who's still kind of alive. 
And when we find out, when Lady Macbeth and them find out that he's coming over to spend the night, well, boom, this is going to be this great opportunity. Um, and there's something, again, risky, which I hope we can kind of hint at. There's something risky about if, imagine, imagine if the president were to say, I'm coming over to your house tonight and we're going to have a sleepover. It's going to be great. Kind of <laughs> yeah. It's kind of surreal, but if that were to happen, what, like, what image is it or what thoughts could go through one's head if, if you knew you were the next in line or could be or something like that, right? So there's this one huge moment where there's like uh, two and a half minutes of just music where we're going to roll out a red carpet, which you'll see in the kind of model pics coming up, but this kind of idea of festivities, of regalness, of um, flags, of that kind of idea of grandeur and importance on that one person. Yeah. <coughs> Our assassins. Oh, some soldiers. So you'll, um, we have our course men have an assassin look. So again, because the set is very urban, we went really urban with them. So they're hoodies, leather jackets, kind of thing. And the hoodies are a bit more medieval, monkish, like sort of Assassin's Creed. That's my direct reference. And yeah. um, just it had a really nice line again to to um, because we're trying to find out who who are they, kind of thing. Who, who are they in this world? And so that you seem like a nice progression for them. Um, and then we've also, but we also do hint at also medieval things. We have Macbeth and Banquo, um, Macduff, Malcolm in breastplates on top of their trench coats. So we're, again, we're sort of amalgamating a few different um, references there. Um, you know, uh, some of our chorus, because I didn't want to do shirt and ties, they're in sort of 90s Nehru jacket, coats, jackets. Um, but hopefully it doesn't look that way. And it actually it references a lot of the Scottish uniforms that they wore more and more on. So that was a nice sort of, um, progression that way. And um, as you'll see in the costume sketches at the end. Um, so again, we're, we're just pulling, just pulling from different places. And Next. Storyboard. So this is pictures of what you may see when, when it's all on stage. It's kind of dark, but there you go. Um, this is how it starts. Um, there's black curtain, curtain goes away. We see all these dead bodies kind of on the um, it's kind of hard to tell, but there's a tri there we go. There's a triangle shaped, uh, which is in the, the downstairs rehearsal hall with this huge kind of crack along the side. There's cracks. These are two big flat um, wall structures that will never leave during the whole um, show. And there's nothing else seen except all these dead bodies. And out of that, um, in the next one, the witches are lying amongst them as well, and all of a sudden they just kind of start oh, moving. <laughs> uh. <laughs> and the witches start coming up from, they've been lying down with the dead bodies, and then they kind of start standing up, and then they start singing and moving amidst these dead bodies. These carry-on birds, these black crows, they, what they feed on, they feed on dead animals. So they, what they do is they pick at dead corpses. And so that's kind of what we're hinting at with these witches. So Macbeth and Banquo, first scene, they kind of come in and they see their good work from fighting the fight, but then they also see these weird sort of creatures, talk about them, find out the news, messengers come in and say, number two is true, oh no, what's gonna happen? Let's go home and find out. So that's that first scene. Next one, which um, some of these images <laughs> Brenda hasn't seen these images. We haven't really had a chance to talk yet. But <laughs> this beautiful, uh, not very simple staircase comes rolling out. We'll talk, we'll talk. <laughs> it's such a beautiful picture, but we'll talk. And basically, she's reading this letter that the king is coming to their house. <laughs> and then she kind of walks down the stage. Yeah. And um, in this scene, it's not shown here, but um, there's going to be a projection of the letter that she is reading. And then from that letter, uh, blood kind of starts pouring out of it, and then it kind of fills as she's calling on these sort of demons and these ministers of evil to come fill her 
her soul with all this kind of excitement. Um, and it's an empty stage. So that's kind of a new piece that's added. The next one, this is, uh, nothing else is added until this is the big king's arrival. Um, and he kind of struts it. So in those two minutes of music, these two supers roll out this beautiful red carpet. The crowd kind of fills in. The Secret Service kind of pours all over to make sure it's secure. And then the king kind of struts out. He doesn't say anything in the whole opera. He's this silent, wonderful actor. Uh, he waves. He has a little hand photo op with, uh, hand shaking photo op with Macbeth. And then he walks off. They clear up the carpet and everyone just disappears. So nothing is said or sung. You just have this wonderful music played and it's kind of this, music even almost has this John Philip Sousa kind of march to it. Um, so that's what it's kind of hinting at and then they leave. Um, what's also not in there is these wonderful sort of Duncan banners are brought in to kind of yay, which kind of change after. <laughs> so the next scene, um, then everyone leaves and we're left alone and this kind of wall, this kind of a uh, scrimmy like wall kind of floods in and he sings the dagger aria and then they plot and just like that Macbeth goes in, we're getting into the psychosis of his mind as he plots to kill, does kill, forever changed from that point on. It's kind of no coming back. She has 16 bars, she kind of runs in, slits two people's throats, comes back and said, deal's done, there we go. <laughs> Then they go off to bed to kind of clean up and then everyone kind of shows up to kind of say what's going on, the king has died, the king has died, oh no, and they kind of cry out and scream to God and then they get a little angry and get a little violent and then it calms down and they all go off to bed wondering what's going to happen. And what does happen, we take a two minute break, we come back and we have these two beautiful throne chairs where we have a new king and we have a new queen, new banners, kind of like Gryffindors and kind of dark colors, LA Kings kind of thing. They're kind of flowing in. It's kind of, we have new bosses. And that's kind of how we set. Wait, 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 wait. So there's no intermission between our four and two? There's like a little pause. Did, did, did you know that I sing La Luce and Langway, this big aria right at the beginning of it? Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know if you did actually do that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Just check in. Yeah, no pause. Go on the stairs, brother. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Two and three. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then that happens. Beautiful scene again. Uh, lots of shadows. There's going to be these shadowy uh, projections as these ministers are there. And we may play with bringing the witches out into the audience, just kind of watching as she's calling out these ministers. There's no direct link between Lady Macbeth and the witches, but as the opera develops, you'll find that she tends more to, to that kind of thinking. and. She never meets them. It's always sort of Macbeth who kind of goes to find them kind of thing, but that's what kind of happens. Um, next little look. Then we have these wonderful skilled assassins, 24 assassins, and they let the one little boy go. But um, <laughs> they're more looking at their weapon. Um, but Banquo comes on and he sings this beautiful aria with his son kind of right there, kind of watching. It's kind of this beautiful moment. And then um, he's been betrayed by um, his best friend, these 24 assassins, come, surround Banquo, Fleance escapes. And that's that scene. Then we move into a big party room. So we bring on these big tables, set it all up um, with all fine dining, with t everything, food, this, that, and whatever. We fly in this beautiful chandelier. Everyone's kind of changes their clothes again um, for the big costume scene, for the ban banquet scene. And this is where the first kind of test of what is um, the supernatural kind of comes in where all of a sudden Macbeth sees Banquo twice or what he thinks is Banquo or he imagines seeing Banquo. And of the two images, there's two times where he sees him. One time will be something similar where this giant shadow will be cast up there. Um, that's one visual image of him kind of saying, I see something, I see Banquo and Lady back. What are you talking about? Just keep drinking. Everyone just calm down. The other time he'll, all the waiters in this choreographed time will go, ta-da, to the wonderful food that's being brought out. And there's Banquo's head just kind of sitting on a platter, kind of staring at, at Macbeth. And he's the only one who sees that it's actually Banquo's head. So he's kind of freaking out because there's his best buddy kind of looking at him. Whereas everyone else is just like, the chicken looks great. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> so. 
uh, the party is just getting into a bit of a downer and it ends with kind of this simple little kind of dance thing while, um, while we're all singing. It's these beautiful end to the acts which have all this um, massive amounts of choral singing. Um, and that's the end of act two. We go to act three where we come back to the same look but in place of the, um, in place of the people are the witches. They're all around the table. They've kind of been disjointed a bit, thrown a, a messy party. They're tearing at the chicken bones. They're kind of peeling away and they're throwing it into the soup cauldrons and they're making this weird potion, kind of setting it up for the big apparition scene, which is um, in this environment as well. Um, I don't think we have a slide for that one. I think the next one is, a, oh yeah, there it is, good. The apparition scene is all done by video and so we don't have that necessarily here, but we're gonna have a, um, three images. One is of uh, sort of a, a warrior with a helmet, and it's gonna be, yeah, it's hard to describe without seeing it. It'll be something exciting to see. The second one is kind of um, blood poured over this. I don't even know if Christy knows about this yet, do you? You do. <laughs> <laughs> All these secrets that are coming out now, she just heard about it. Um, it's kind of this image though, but blood, kind of think Carrie, the movie Carrie kind of thing. Slow motion kind of blood poured over this, no woman born of a man shall, the second kind of prophecy hint. Um, and the third one is kind of Burnham Woods moving towards until Burnham Woods you won't be overtaken. And so we kind of have this, again, tree with the roots and this kind of hangman sort of image with a child crown kind of thing. Um, that overtakes the whole stage and then we get into the second half of the apparitions which are these, um, which is the next slide, the eight kings that come walking across and think hazy kind of feels, we have, in, do you want a river flying? We have eight different images of eight different kings of eight different periods kind of thing. Yes, yeah, so the king's idea is that we, we sort of start very medieval and then we get to our modern king. So we, we do our eight kings through time um, until we get up to uh, Banquo. Banquo. Yeah. So, and, and they just kind of cross the stage one at a time with Macbeth kind of yelling in their faces and they're just not really responding. So you kind of see this eight different royalty pass by. Uh, and the next one, this beginning of Act 4, and then it, Act 3 ends with this crazy revenge duet. Uh, they want to get revenge on someone. <laughs> and that happens. Curtain comes down and we bring everyone back on. My favorite scene is Macduff when he finds out that his family's dead in the play, and that's not in this one. So what I've kind of created is he's down here, and in the first sort of chorus, they're all singing, but we see sort of his family right there. So they're kind of lying there dead, and it's kind of this look at what this man, Macbeth, has done to all of us. Yes, we're, we've been exiled, but also it's very personal. Um, at the end of the big chorus number, they all kind of walk in front of them and then they just kind of stand up. So it's more of a memory as he kind of then says, you know, this is what this man has done personally to me and my family. Um, and he's beautifully downstage, almost centrish. So it's almost good for, yeah. Yeah, the tenor spot. Uh, the next one. So as it happens, then Malcolm comes back, this sort of chosen son who kind of fled away when the king was kill fear of safety, but now he's back and we're gonna fight through by picking up, as he says, branches and kind of sneaking away through that. We kinda, we kinda don't really do that, but we will have sort of these trees that kind of move backwards as if we're kind of doing the Lemis thing, possibly where we're walking through the woods kind of thing to get towards Macbeth's fortress. Um, from that we go into yeah, the very f famous scene. Um, and what it is is just Lady Macbeth simply walking or stationary. Again, it's something that we'll find out what it will be. But it's the most beautiful uh, scene in the opera, in opera in general. And at the moment, the doctor and lady in waiting will actually come in through the audience to kind of watch with all of us to kind of say, look what she's, you're talking to the audience, look what she's doing everybody. She just does this night after night after night. And so we're not kind of on stage, but we're kind of at the pit looking up at her as she just sings this haunting piece. Yeah, the next one, 
then war fighting victory and finale. <laughs> And so what happens after that? He finds out about all this. Lady Macbeth basically dies right after she sings this. We don't know how, off stage. Then we have kind of a big battle. It's going to be fighting, sort of. That's the best way to describe it for now. But this choreographed fighting, and basically all the supers die, and they're left dead on the stage while the rest of us sing this mighty um, chorus. And the chorus ladies will be watching again from the audience as well, kind of saying, who's going who's gonna to win, who's going to help, long live the king kind of thing for hopefully Malcolm and all that stuff, which he does. And that's the opera. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Any questions or anything like that? Or is that how it works? I'm not sure. <laughs> Tweet away the, the streamers. Do you have any questions for, uh, for Joel? I think it's going to be a really exciting show and a great way to start the year. Uh, and uh, bravo to you and your team. And uh, I'm looking forward to opening night. Thank you all. Thank you.